want to welcome everyone to the Women's History Month event. Um, and this is also a Humanities Forum event. Um, and uh, so let me make that uh, announcement. Um, before introducing today's speakers, though, I, I wanted to give a bit of background on, on Women's History Month itself. Um, an event with its own long and often forgotten history, I'm only going to do the most recent part. Um, and that is that it's a product of the women's movement of the 1960s. Um, in December of 1961, when John F. Kennedy issued an executive order that established the first President's Commission for, on the Status of Women to investigate and recommend policy that could in, um, improve the status of working women, that commission took as part of its, um, took its charge very broadly. And by 1963, um, under the direction of a woman named Esther Peterson, who had been the uh, Assistant Secretary of Labor and the highest ranking woman in the Kennedy administration, um, outlined its findings and argued that one of the things that needed to happen was women needed to be written back into American history. And so that was taken up in states and counties around the country and led to Women's History Weeks during the 1960s and 70s. Um, and then two years later, um, uh, no, excuse me, um, several years later, in, um, when President Carter was president in the mid-70s, he issued the first proclamation that made Women's History Week a thing around the country um, and around March 8th, which is also alre was already established for a long time as International Women's Day, that's today. Um, and then in 1981, Representative Orrin Hatch, uh, Republican of Utah, and Representative, then Representative Barbara Mikulski co-sponsored um, a joint congressional resolution that proclaimed um, National Women's History Month, and then in 1987 it was, uh, I mean, National History Week, and then in 1987 it was made a month because there was too much to do in one week. Um, at the same time, International Women's Day in the 1970s was formalized. It had been in many nations a, a day of celebrating and recognizing women, but not necessarily with a radical edge. Um, but in 1975, the UN, as part of the International Women's Year, um, started to, to re-emphasize International Women's Day and women's organizations around the world since then have um, used the day to hold large-scale events that celebrate women's achievement and remind us of the, and this is a quote from the UN, the continued vigilance and action required to ensure that gender equity is obtained and maintained in all aspects of life. Um, our, the sponsors for today's event are, uh, as I said, it's a women's uh, uh, history, I'll get it, a Humanities Forum event, and it's sponsored by the Gender and Women's Studies Program, the Dresher's uh, Center for the Humanities, and the History Department. Um, also, I want to call your attention to a couple of things that we have over there. There's a, the, in addition to books that you can buy, there's a flyer in honor of International Women's Day LLC students, the Language, Literacy, and Culture PhD program students, put together a flyer on how you can and where to make donations that provide um, support for women's relief in Haiti and Chile, um, and um, which are currently urgent needs. That's this. And then also the WILL program, the Women Involved in Learning and Leadership program that is sponsored by the Gender and Women's Studies program, um, has put together a bookmark commemorating today's lecture and the topic with um, interesting quotes on the back. Now I'd like to turn the podium over to Emmett Ergen, who is a PhD candidate in the Language, Literacy, and Culture program and a GA in Gender and Women's Studies, who will introduce our speaker. Everybody and thank you for all um, coming together here to celebrate International Women's Day and Women's, Hi uh, Women's History Month with us. Before I introduce you our guest speaker, Hannah Blank, I'd like to thank the Gender and Women's Studies, the Dresher Center for the Humanities, and History Department, along with the co-sponsors, for organizing this wonderful event. 
um, and giving us an opportunity to hear firsthand Hannah's in a way to work on the history of virginity, a topic too often taken for granted, marginalized in intellectual trains, and not deemed worthy of scholarly research, all of which Hannah's book Virgin has proved wrong. Virginity should be seriously questioned and problematized. I'd like to start my introduction with a personal note on how Hannah was introduced into my life in 2004 and how the traces of her scholarly work have clearly been recognizable in my scholarly work since then. It was in November 2004 that I first met Hannah as she was giving a talk about her research on the history of virginity um, and she was doing this at, at Tufts University where she was a scholar of the Institute for, Institute of, for Teaching and Research on Women and I was a novice master's student of, you know, women's studies. Um, and it would not be an exaggeration if I told you that listening to Hannah uh, was not only an eye-opening experience for me, but also a key moment in my academic history. When I met her, I was similarly working on the social construction of virginity, but in the historical context of Turkey. And and I was having trouble with finding a comprehensive source that directly problematized virginity itself. It was as if everybody was, would use the concept virgin as one of those naturalized words in language, yet nobody would ask, where did this concept come from? Why does it exist? Did it always exist? What does it mean? Did it always mean the same thing? Who benefits from this concept? Who is harmed by it? I had some theories for some of these questions, but I lacked reliable uh, sources, especially those written from feminist perspectives, that would provide me with historical information and different standpoints that would broaden my approach to the subject. Hannah, being the generous person she is, not only provided me with answers backed up by rigorous research, but also encouraged me to ask more questions and look at the issue from different angles. Also, she agreed to be a member of my thesis committee and gave me an unpublished copy of Virgin, which brought up the first idea of translating it into Turkish. And we will talk about this translation experience after um, Hannah's talk. So once again, expressing my gratitude for offering me her support and encouragement, and for giving me the unique experience of a wonderful cooperation between a translator and an author, I would like to turn the spotlight completely on our speaker and introduce her published works. So Hannah Blank is a writer, historian, and an independent scholar. She is the author and editor of several books. Her latest book, which I have already mentioned, is Virgin, the Untouched History, which was first published in 2007 from Bloomsbury. Her unruly epitaphs, Erotica, was published in 2003. She also edited Shameless, Women's Intimate Erotica, and Best Transgender Erotica, both published in 2002 and Zaftik, Well-Rounded Erotica, published in 2001. She wrote Big Big Love, a source book on sex for people of size and those who love them, published in 2000. And aside from books, Hannah has also published in many periodicals, including In These Times, Southwest Art, Lilith, and The Bitch Magazine, among others. Her short stories and essays have been published in anthologies such as Nothing But Red, published in 2008. Hannah has been interviewed on radio and television channels across the US, Australia, the UK, and Canada, and she has given several interviews for Turkish periodicals and newspapers. She has also been very active as a public speaker and educator, and she has visited many adult learning centers and campuses, as well as national and regional conferences. As I mentioned before, she has been the 2004-2005 Scholar of the Institute for Teaching and Research on Women at Towson University, and she has also served at faculty positions at several colleges and universities, inclu including Brandeis University, Tufts University, and Whitworth College. Hannah, who is formally trained both as a classical musician and historian, was awarded the George Whitfield Chadwick Medal in 1991, the highest award of the prestigious New England Conservatory of Music. Among Hannah's publications, Virgin has probably been academically the most inspirational and probably influential one. The book starts with the provocative statement, by any material reckoning, virginity does not exist. The book could be described as a myth buster, as virginity itself is a big myth, and, is comp and the book is comprised of two main parts. The first part, titled Virginology, starts by highlighting the indefinable yet momentous phenomenon called virginity and explains 
why virginity has been such an important organizing and normative concept throughout Western history. Then the author delves into history that shows how the social construction of this concept has evolved as Western societies went through serious transformations. It's in the first part that Hannah problematizes Hyman and reveals the critical role that modern medicine played in fixing virginity as an objective, measurable, scientific fact. The second part, titled Virgin Culture, investigates the history of cultural development of virginity. Going back to the history of early Christianity, then proceeding to the late medieval times and European Renaissance, and coming all the way to the 21st century US, the second part traces the cultural formations and transformations of the virginity concept, such as Queen Elizabeth and her public image created as the Virgin Queen, the colonization projects and the construction of the new lands as virgins, the fetishizing and manufacturing of virginity in pornography, the US government's abstinence policies, etc. Although a brief introduction like this one cannot do justice to the broad scope of virgin, I hope it has generated some curiosity in you to grab the book and start reading this fascinating untouched history of virginity. And if you're not curious enough yet, uh, maybe you will be after hearing about all the wonderful reviews the book has received. Virgin has been reviewed in so many periodicals that I don't think I will be able to mention all of them here. I'll try. Um, the list includes Washington Post, New York Times, New York Observer, San Diego Union Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, Chicago Sun-Times, Publishers Weekly, Baltimore City Paper, The Booklist Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, and The Beach Magazine. Here are a few examples showing how these very positive reviews have described Virgin. Entertaining and erudite, eye-opening cultural history, erudite and witty, fascinating, a pleasure to read, a well-researched history of virginity, an informative, funny, and provocative analysis, and finally, what a huge contribution to the study of sexuality and gender. In addition, in addition to these great reviews, Virgin has also greatly influenced later scholarly works on virginity. So I'm definitely not the only person who has been inspired by Hannah's work. For example, just recently, a book called The Purity Myth, How America's Obsession with Virginity is Hurting Young Women by Jessica Valenti came out, and the impact of Hannah's work is obvious here, as Valenti, um, in the very first chapter titled The Cult of Virginity, frequently mentions and cites Hannah. So I believe that there are lots of people, readers, scholars, students, activists, etc., who deeply appreciate Hannah's research on virginity. In conclusion, Virgin powerfully demonstrates that the virginity concept is a social, political, and historical invention that has taken multiple shapes across history and look across different locations. But its major function of keeping women's bodies and sexualities under the control and in the service of male-dominant heteronormative institutions seems to be the most consistent and persistent among others. Although this doesn't mean that this pervasive concept is not resisted, disrupted, manipula manipulated, or subverted. It has, uh, it has always been, and today perhaps all the more so. And I believe that Virgin has provided its readers with more reasons to resist and tools to bring social change on this issue, as well as, I'm quoting, a spirit of immense battery activism, as Marina Warner from the Washington Post wrote in her review. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome all of you again, and I present you the author of The Virgin, The Untouched History, and a blank. Well, after an introduction like that, I kind of feel like I should just stand up here and glow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna put this little clip there. Thank you very much, Emic. We're, are we good with the video? All right, excellent. Um, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Thank you all for coming out and joining me for that. It's one of my favorite holidays. And um, I, I have a little, a little present for all of you on International Women's Day. Ms. Magazine has launched its new blog. Um, they've been uh, planning this for a long time. And on this International Women's Day, March 8, 2010, Ms. Magazine, the flagship feminist publication in here in America, has launched its blog showcasing, as they say, the sharp writing and informed opinions of a community of feminist bloggers from around the nation and around the world. 
Um, and I'm one of their bloggers, so is my, my friend Paula Kamen, um, Deborah Siegel, uh, sociologist Shira Tarrant, um, Linnell George, uh, the journalist from LA, um, Moroccan feminist Fatima Siddiqui, uh, Lina Abarafe, who's currently reporting from Haiti, and a whole bunch of other really fantastic folks. So um, check it out. And uh, you can find it on the Ms. Magazine website. The talk that I'm going to give today is, um, is not an attempt to recapitulate my book. Um, that's why I wrote a book, so that I wouldn't have to do that. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about what it's like to do the work of researching and writing a book like Virgin, and what it did for me as a humanist, um, as a historian, as a feminist, um, and as a woman living in the world and having to deal with all of these kinds of issues in my daily life, as I know we all do. So it's called Virgin Territory on Writing a History of Virginity. I became a historian because I am essentially a pretty childish person. Not in a temper tantrum throwing, screaming, kicking kind of way, but in the way that every parent of a toddler learns to dread. I am the kid who asks why. <laughs> History can't always give us the ultimate answers to the question why, those ultimate life, the universe, and everything sort of answers. But it is pretty good at giving us some ideas about why and how things happen the way they happen, what dynamics and what forces go into creating the conditions and meanings and understandings that we all take for granted. It's a great discipline to get into if you are, in fact, the type of childish person whose most typical question is why and whose most common response to any answer she happens to get is also why. Women's history is a particularly fruitful field for the person who asks why. As I put it in a piece that I recently wrote for the Ms. blog, there is an awful lot of mystery in women's history. And that means a lot of places where it is not only possible to ask why, but where you must ask why, because otherwise you'll never know, because the information isn't easily available in these convenient pre-digested forms we call books. History of sexuality is the same way. There's simply a lot we don't know, a lot that was never directly recorded, a lot of holes in the literature, a lot of gaps in the record, a lot of places where there is to, quote Gertrude Stein, no there there. You all know the story behind no there there, don't you? She said it about Oakland, California, but she wasn't being dismissive. It often gets misquoted. She said this, she grew up in Oakland, California. Her father was quite wealthy, had done very well in the railroad trade, and their wealthy family, pillars of the community, she lived there throughout most of her later childhood and adolescence. Many years later, after having lived in Paris for about 30 years with Alice B. Toklas and a succession of poodles who were all named Basket, <laughs> she returned to Oakland on a visit to find to her consternation and to her sadness that most of the places she remembered, her home, her school, the synagogue where her family worshipped, were gone. There was no there there. The art of doing history, particularly women's history, history of sexuality, and all these places where women's and gender history and history of sexuality intersect, is in very large part the art of seeing where there is no there there, and then asking, but why? I'm often asked how I came to write a history of virginity. It's uh, such a strange topic, people say to me. So transitory, so evanescent, to say nothing of being a bit squalid, and, well, frankly, old-fashioned. I came to write a history of virginity because there was literally no there there. At the time, one of the jobs I was working uh, as a volunteer was as a sex educator with a mostly teen and young adult population. And I don't know if any of you have ever worked as sex educators with people between the ages of about 13 and 19. And they're, they're mostly starting to become sexually active, and there are a lot of questions about what counts. <laughs> what is just fooling around versus what is doing it? 
that sort of thing. And what it boiled down to over and over again was that these young people would come to me and basically ask me to pass judgment on whether or not they were still virgins. They didn't know. And to be completely honest, neither did I. My job as a sex educator was not to go around making pronouncements. You over there, you're a virgin. You over there, you're not a virgin. It's a Tuesday, so you get to be a virgin. No. My job was to make sure that whatever they were doing, they were doing in, a, in an atmosphere that was free of coercion or fear, that they knew what they were getting into, that they had some clue about things like safer sex and contraception. It really wasn't my job to tell them about virginity. And yet I ended up having an awful lot of conversations that went something like this. So what do you think, Ms. Blank? Am I still a virgin? And I would say, I don't know. Do you want to be? <laughs> Eventually, these questions started to get to me. Virginity was supposed to be so clear cut, wasn't it? I mean, people say you never forget your first time, which sort of presumes that you know what it is. And besides, people had been using virginity as a yardstick. I knew this as an historian for thousands of years. I mean, this is one of the big moments, the big qualifiers in a woman's life historically. And I knew that even doctors talked about it. Uh, doctors sometimes examined women to see whether they were or weren't virgins, and that in forensic cases, um, medical professionals often looked at the bodies of women and girls to see if there was proof of abuse or rape. So surely, I thought, there must be a cast iron standard definition of virginity out there. So I was living in Boston at the time. I got on the subway. I went over to Countway Medical Library, which is Harvard's medical school library, to see if I could find it. I knew logically it should have existed. And I looked in all the logical places. I looked in medical dictionaries, zilch. Looked in encyclopedias, nada. Gynecology textbooks got me a little closer. They told me how the hymen was formed and what to do in the unlikely event that I should be presented with a woman who could not menstruate due to imperforate hymen. But virginity, an actual definition? Well, not so much. I was beginning to think that the true knowledge of the secret of virginity was a trade secret of the I'd tell you, but then I'd have to kill you variety. Well, it didn't take me too long to realize that when you've got that many partial definitions flying around and that many contradictory definitions flying around and that many non-definitions flying around, well, you've got yourself a story. And here's my first big pro tip for all of you here today as far as doing academic work on women's lives, on gender issues, on women's history. Whenever you come across a topic where Everybody knows how it works. Be very, very suspicious. Don't just shrug and assume you haven't looked in the right places and that people must know because, well, they say they do, because people lie. <laughs> people lie because they don't know that they're lying. People give you the best information they have. That's no guarantee that they're right. So if someone gives you an answer, on one of these everybody knows questions. And the answer seems a little strange to you, a little hinky. It's probably because it is. Women in particular get taught from a very early age to silence that little voice, that inner bullshit detector that says, no, I don't think so. We get told to silence that in favor of being good. Part of being good is being submissive and accepting what you're told and not asking pesky questions. It is not actually good for you to stop listening to your inner bullshit detector. And it is often actively bad for you to not ask pesky questions. That little voice should not be put on hold like an annoying cell phone. It's only good for other people when no one calls shenanigans on their shenanigans. Pesky questions are my favorite tool for chipping away at the patriarchy. So if you ask a question and you get an answer that doesn't sit right with you, trust that little voice and keep asking why until you get a good answer. And if you don't get a good answer and you keep getting answers that boil down to, well, 
because that's the way it is. That's why. Well, congratulations. You have found an invisible wall. There is no there there. You know there should be something there, or in the case of something historical, there should be evidence that at least once there was. But there's not. Instead, there's a, a feeling like there's a ghost in the room, a sensation that there's something right in front of you that you can't see or touch. You just know it's there. Cultures are built out of invisible walls. Invisible walls are the ideas, the concepts, the philosophies, the beliefs, and the dogmas that we collectively believe to be absolutely true, the notions that not only make sense of our lives, but by which we believe life is organized. We believe, for instance, that there are these things called seconds and minutes and hours. Each of these is an invisible wall. Well, why a second? Why a minute? It's because that's what the clock measures, right? Right. We built the clocks. So why is it that we measure a second as being equivalent to 9,192,631,770 oscillations or cycles of the resonant frequency of an atom called cesium? I mean, do you even know what cesium is? Could you tell me if I asked you what its number is on the periodic table? It's 55, by the way. Can you think of a single reference point in your daily life to cesium? Why don't we just say that a second's about as much time as it takes to say one Mississippi? Is cesium better than one Mississippi? More accessible than one Mississippi? Easier to use? More to the point, why is it that we believe that a second is a thing? Obviously, this is a fiction. It's a convenience that has been conjured up in this incredibly arcane way in a ritual space called a laboratory. And yet, we believe that seconds are a thing. We, try to, we just had the Olympics. You saw people trying to shave seconds off of their time in those ski runs or shave seconds off their speed skating record. And if you don't have an unlimited cell phone plan, what do you get charged by? Seconds, portions of minutes. We monetize them. And if you needed any better proof of the depth and the concreteness of our belief in the existence of this thing called a second, I don't think you'll need to look much further. This is what invisible walls do. They can and do organize your entire life. They do it not just to you, but to everyone. The French anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu had a theory about invisible walls. He called them doxa. Doxa is a Greek word, and it means common belief or common opinion. It's related to words like orthodox. What Bourdieu meant by doxa are the things, by which, the things that a culture believes to be true at such a level that the cult people who are part of that culture consider them to be self-evident. You know, like the idea that time is made up of things called seconds. Or the idea that people who haven't had sex with a partner possess this quality called virginity. You begin to understand why my search for a definition of virginity, something that could not possibly be more part of the category labeled stuff everyone knows, became so frustrating. I had entered the doxa zone. I was surrounded by invisible walls. And so what do you do as a historian when you're surrounded by invisible walls? Well, for a while, you look like a mime doing that thing. Oh, help, help, I'm trapped in an invisible box. It's OK, you can't help it. Because the problem with invisible walls is that they're invisible. They're hard to describe. You can say, oh, I've found this big conceptual problem and it has to do with virginity. And all you've done is invoke an idea that everyone thinks they understand and they look at you like you're a little touched in the head because what is so conceptually difficult about virginity? Everyone knows how that works. I can't tell you how many people, when I told them I was writing a history of virginity, said, well, that'll be a short book. <laughs> the problem with invisible walls, and there are legions of them in women's history, sexual history, cultural studies, gender studies. 
is you have to find ways to make it possible for other people to see them. This happens through the process of writing and teaching, and it's not easy. It's what I had to learn to do, often working pretty blindly, as I wrote Virgin. I had to learn to lead people through the mazes of their own culture so that they, too, could come up against this invisible wall. The most effective way I've found to do this, and here's your next pro tip to all you budding historians, is to start thinking about what kinds of ideas are most difficult to articulate because of the invisible wall. This isn't easy for the good reason that there's a wall there, but you know where they are and that helps. For instance, opposites. What is the opposite of virginity? I'll wait. <laughs> Be rigorous. Slut is often opposed to virgin virginity and casual speech, but is sluttiness really an opposite to virginity? think so. It's tempting, but it's sloppy. You can think in terms of vocabulary. Invisible walls shape language and the kinds of concepts we put into language. How would you describe a person who had never experienced partnered sexual activity without using the word virgin? How could you characterize the idea of changing one's sexual status going from being a person who hasn't experienced partnered sexual activity to a person who has experienced partnered sex without using the notion of losing your virginity. Another useful trick, make lists of things you know logically should exist. I call it an if-then list. For instance, if virginity exists objectively, as a state or as a thing, then it should have certain properties like observability or materiality. There should be phenomena, in other words, that we can measure by some reasonably objective external standard that will tell us whether someone is a virgin or a non-virgin. From there, you start drilling down with your ifs and thens. For instance, if virginity is a physical quality of the body, then there should be some part or some aspect of the body that is reliably, demonstrably different when virginity is present than when virginity is absent. Or if virginity has a psychosomatic component or a psychoactive component, this is something we should be able to test for. So now you're armed with a bunch of questions that need answers. And you can go and look and see if you can find them. This is where the library comes in. You can look at the medical literature, review the gynecology journals, ask doctors who specialize in research on women's genitals, and there are quite a few of them. Um, talk to forensic physicians. In my case, I also reviewed psychological and psychiatric literature and did a bunch of digging in the sociological literature. And then if you want to make sure that the answers you find, because you'll find some, seem robust to you, that they're really as sturdy and as reasonable and as defensible as possible, then you have to start looking at their evidence. And that, just as an aside, is why everyone in this room who has not taken statistics needs to go take statistics. Seriously, I know you're all rolling your eyes going, oh, please, no, not math. But things like observer bias and confirmation bias exist. They are real. And those are the kinds of things that make the difference between an accurate interpretation of a statistical study and the kind of BS you read in the paper. <laughs> and if you're going to do academic work, you need to know how to look at somebody's data set, look at their numbers, and find out whether or not they're telling you the truth or whether they are doing something that should be making your bullshit detector go whoop, 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 because a lot of the time they are. So sometimes you're not going to find answers to your question but you'll find evidence that other people asked those questions. And either they came up empty-handed or they came up with inconclusive data. Most research, especially in the sciences, produces inconclusive data. A lot of it doesn't get published. Be aware of that. It's a good place to ask questions. Is how, much of your, how many of your experiments, what kinds of experiments produced inconclusive data? Because that was the case with 
all but one of my if-then questions about the material nature of virginity, inconclusive data or no data at all. And it wasn't that no one had looked for evidence that virginity had physical correlates, that it was a physical bodily phenomenon. It just hadn't actually found any. Now sometimes you ask questions, you start asking why, and then you don't find any data. Sometimes this means that nobody else has ever asked the question that you're asking. So this brings up a new question. Why not? Especially when you're doing historical research, clearly you are not working with something that has never existed in the world before. Why has no one looked for an answer? Why has no one started asking why? One of the issues in my work on virginity um, where this came up was the question of genital bleeding at first vaginal penetration. My first question, of course, was if it existed, why did it exist? And with some dedicated digging and the help of the few works that I was able to find that dealt with the history of virginity at all, and there aren't very many, I found literally dozens of answers for this. Some of them were more fanciful than others, and they dated back as far as the fourth century in the Common Era. Some people thought there was a web of blood vessels and subtle tissues inside the vagina that held the walls together, and then when the vagina was penetrated, it would break them and the blood would run out. Other people thought there was a sort of nodule or knot or cyst of tissue inside the, inside the vagina. One, one writer says that it looks like a chickpea, as if he'd ever seen it. Um, and that when it gets crushed by a penetrating penis, then the blood comes out of it, kind of like squashing a grape. And then there were theories that the vagina was pleated, like an accordion or, or, the, or, the, or the bendy section in a bendy straw, <laughs> and that that kept it sort of short and narrow. And then when a penis was inserted into it, because of course all penises are, are big, right? It would stretch it out. And then it would bleed because it would rip away these little tiny tethers of tissue that would have been holding it all in place all these years. There were theories ancient and modern about membranes and webs and nets of tissue, ideas about the skin of the vagina being very fragile before its first contact with what I can only call the magic penis because apparently it was only fragile the first time it came in contact with the magic penis. And after that, it was a tough old broad and you could push her around all you want. Um, so I collected all these explanations and I put them in my file, sort of assuming that, okay, maybe I wasn't finding the right answer, but I would keep looking and eventually I would find the one, the true, the right answer to this. And I have to say, I, I, I will embarrass myself and, and tell you that it was three years of this before my bullshit detector went off. And then it dawned on me that no one actually knew at all. There had been a lot of people who were willing to make educated guesses, a lot of people who were willing to use the fact that they had, you know, a penis and an MD degree, uh, MD after their name, to get people to believe them, that they were authoritative when they said, well, yes, absolutely, and it works like this. I had done all this research, and there were only four things that I knew for sure about bleeding at first penetration. And this is based on research from the fourth century to the 21st century. First, I knew that some people had really creative ideas about what women's genitals were like. Second, no one actually knew where the blood, if there was any, came from. Third, I knew that bleeding at first penetration didn't actually happen to everyone. And that four, there has never been a systematic study of women experiencing first time vaginal penetration to see who bleeds and why. Soak that in. You can see the if-thens coming, can't you? I'm not going to list them because we'll be here all day. I'll just cut to the chase. If doctors and legal scholars knew since the fourth century that vaginal penetration for the first time did not produce the same physical consequences in every woman every time, then how come so many of them proceeded and indeed continue to this day to proceed on the basis that whether or not a woman's vagina bleeds the first time she's penetrated means something. 
This is something that's been used as proof to legitimize inclusion or ostracism from a community, shame or glory, access to education and employment, sometimes life and death. And why was it that I felt like I was wandering into virgin territory by just asking this really elementary question? I mean, this is not as obscure as, for instance, how many oscillations of a cesium atom happen in a second. This was, why is it that all over the world, in almost every culture that we know about, women's credibility, community and family standing, relationships, and even their lives are put on the line of a bodily event that might happen or it might not, and no one knows why. I spent a lot of time banging my head on invisible walls, which I hope tells you a little bit of why it's worth doing. Historical and intellectual work on issues of gender and sex are not merely academic. Asking, but why, but why, all the time isn't just a childish indulgence. There's a lot in our culture and a lot in the world that we think we understand, but we know nothing about. There's a lot in our culture and a lot in our world that we don't like, but that we accept because we've been taught that, well, that's just the way it is, and we don't ask why. We won't know if that's really true unless we start asking questions, and then think critically about the answers you find, and then ask some more questions, because if you get an answer and it doesn't lead you to any more questions, you're doing it wrong. What you may find, and this is certainly what I found in doing my work on virginity, is that there is, in effect, an alternate universe out there. It's not very far away. It's right on the other side of an invisible wall. And the instant you can see where the invisible walls are, you can start to get a glimpse of what is on the other side. And there's a lot out there. I'm not talking about utopias. The world is not that simple. The other side of virginity taboo is not, we no virginity is taboos for anyone everywhere, complete sexual liberation, woohoo, let's go. The other side of virginity taboo is down the rabbit hole. It is, for instance, the Gitano, the ethnic Rom, or uh, gypsy population of Spain, for whom virginity is indisputably physical and completely unlike the way we think of it. For the Gitano, a woman's virginity is contained in the uva, the grape. It's a little tiny organ that lives in the vagina. Doesn't exist in Gray's Anatomy. No Western scientist has ever documented its existence. But as far as the Gitano are concerned, this is real, and it contains a yellowish, clear liquid. And the Gitano woman, traditionally, who is about to be married, loses her virginity, not with her husband, but with other women, in a ceremony where a village elder, often a woman who also serves as a midwife, presses the juice from her grape with her fingers wrapped in a handkerchief, so that there are stains that represent the woman's virginity, this yellowish fluid on the handkerchief, which is given to her mother, who keeps it forever. So Gitano women, traditionally, don't go to the altar as virgins, but they do go to the altar as women who have never had a penis penetrate them. What's virginity then? How does that work? Like I said, you get to the other side of an invisible wall and you go down the rabbit hole. You start to see what some of the other possibilities are, what some of the other ways that these things can be done and have been done and continue to be done are like. And you've never imagined most of them because you live in a world made out of invisible walls. In Act 1, Scene 5 of Hamlet, Horatio comes in and Hamlet's been talking to his father's ghost, and Horatio says, oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange, to which Hamlet replies, and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt in your philosophy. And I love this. Not the there are more things, although that also pertains, 
What I love is this witty, wise, throwaway bit of banter, so Shakespeare. But this is wondrous strange, and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. This is what's at the core of the work that I do. My work on virginity, and my current work, I'm writing a history of heterosexuality, another tiny topic. <laughs> it should be, I think, at the core of all the work we do in terms of sex and gender and sexuality, because we're taking the things that our culture tells us are strange, are abnormal, are taboo or weird, or my favorite word, inappropriate. <laughs> These are all strangers in our midst. And it's up to us to see those strangers and give them welcome. If we go deliberately to the places that are haunted by ghosts, of things that we know should exist or know once existed, but which have been erased either by time or by intent, and places where there's no there there, and we search long and hard for evidence, that evidence is almost guaranteed to be strange. And over and over again, we're going to get stopped by invisible walls, and we're going to go through all the struggles and all the strategies to figure out how to say what that wall is and why it's there and what's on the other side. And by definition, we've never seen what's on the other side of that wall before. It's strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. I spent about six years working on virginity, welcoming that stranger in over and over again. And as often as I found it frustrating, maddening, depressing, and, and honestly frightening, and let me tell you, these, the years that I spent in virginity were often like a forced march through a neck deep latrine of misogyny. And there were a lot of times when I seriously considered just giving back my advance and saying, forget it, I'm, I can't do this. I'm grateful to all of those invisible walls that I hit and all those places where there was no there there and all the weirdness, because this is a weird topic, people, and all the things that really still, after six years of work and a few years since the book came out, still make no sense to me at all. Because that was what ultimately cracked my head open and woke me up to the fact that the best way to understand a subject like virginity was to stop expecting that there was a logical, reasonable answer or set of answers and to start embracing the strangeness. I mean, if the information you have that supposedly explains something isn't logical, that in and of itself is a fact. That's not an opinion. That means something. When we have multiple conflicting interpretations for a single phenomenon or a, a single object, that tells us something important about that phenomenon or that object. It tells us that it's complicated, that it's possible to have more than one understanding of it, and that people, and this is important, think it's important enough to fight about. When people make decisions about women's lives based on a physical phenomenon, that might or might not happen, and nobody knows why, this tells us something. It doesn't tell us anything about women, to be completely honest. But it tells us a lot about the people who are making the decisions for women and about women. And it tells us a hell of a lot about the kinds of decisions they think they're making. This, for me, was the most important lesson and the most important thing I learned about what I do when I was working on the history of virginity. Um, interviewers always, in their eternal search for the perfect soundbite, ask me, what was the most interesting thing you learned when you were writing this book? And what they want is a factoid. They want me to describe, for instance, the Hitano and the Uva, which is a great factoid. I'll give you that. But the most important thing I learned from writing this book is not a fact. It's a philosophy. We simply do not have to approach the work we do as academics, as historians, as cultural studies people, sociologists, whatever. We don't have to approach this work with a preoccupation that there is a there there. We can walk into that mystery without this attitude that I'm mining for diamonds and by golly, I'm going to find me some. We can carefully and consciously and deliberately develop a practice of intellectual hospitality where when the stranger comes to our door, we invite it in. We give it welcome. 
because that's the way you get to have the conversations where you get to ask why. Thank you. And now, Emic, this is my translator. And I have to say, um, for those of you who've never had a book in translation, what an unbelievable privilege it is to actually know your translator. Um, it's not the first book I've had translated, but it's the first time that I ever um, knew my translator beforehand, and the first time that I was ever able to have an ongoing conversation with my translator. In general, when a publisher buys a book for translation, it's like sending your child to reform school. <laughs> you pack it up in a box, you send them a file, and then eventually, if you're lucky and they remember, you get a copy of a book in the mail that is in a language which you may or may not be able to read except for the fact that it has your name on the spine. And you don't know what is in it unless you can read that language. It could have you know, mushroom soup recipes. You, have, you don't know. And you don't know what's been done to your text because you don't know the person who transformed your text. And um, so I'm, I'm extremely lucky, very, very fortunate, not only to have a translator whom I know and whom I like, but who I trust and whose values as a feminist and as a scholar I knew I could trust implicitly as she went through the process of turning my book into a language that I certainly do not read. <laughs> so, um, I've, and I've been wanting to know, right, and I saved it for today, what were the hardest parts to translate? <laughs> oh, well. And, you know, Hannah told me about this question the other day, and I thought about what was the hardest part. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples, but um, overall I cannot say it was an easy project because, I mean, the book is basically um, about uh, the history of virginity in the West, and the, the Hannah also has a very special, unique kind of language that she uses in the book, which is, you know, sometimes hard to translate, you know, she uses um, very American words um, that you know, I struggle with how do I how do I translate this into Turkish and all that. But um, usually, when I talk about this translation project, um, I talk about the translation of the term hymen, uh, which was a big problem for me when I was translating this book. And the reason is that in Turkish, the word that is used for hymen is kızlıksar, which literally translates as the membrane of girlhood. So we have this. Um, binary construction of girlhood versus womanhood, and the line is basically the magic penis again. Um, so, and I did not want to use that term in my text because obviously it reflected the definition of women's bodies, women's selves, women's you know women's lives from a very um, male-centered perspective. So I decided to translate the term hymen as hymen, um, and the. The word, you know, hymen, hymen is the, almost the same thing. And the word exists in Turkish, but almost exclusively in medical texts. So probably only doctors, maybe nurses, you know, know about this term, um, hymen. And if you talk to a person who is not affiliated with the medical institution, probably they will be say, what? Um, but I decided to use the term. and. Um, so I thought that it created a more neutral linguistic tone in the text, rather than constantly saying the membrane of girlhood and reproducing that whole um, male-dominant ideology about women's bodies all over again. Um, and I will cut this short here, but you know, it had. The, I mean, this translation has some other problems, but. So you read Turkish, I don't. What has the press in Turkey been like for the book? Well, surprisingly, um, I have received amazing attention from the press, which is quite surprising because translators are usually very invisible. They don't get a lot of attention or recognition in the public you know, area. So um, as soon as the book came out, I started realizing that the book was getting reviews in the newspapers and some you know, publications. And these were not just feminist publications. So it was great to see these positive reviews. Um, and I think one reason why the book got so much attention 
um, is aside from the, you know, it's about virginity, always a controversial topic, especially in Turkey. But also I think because I wrote um, a long introduction to this book, um, you know, aside from translating it into Turkish, and in the introduction, I basically try to shortly do what Hannah does for Western histories. I, be, I um, located or I positioned all these virginity discourses in the history of Turkey. So I talked about virginity examinations, which historically um, been some serious, you know, a serious problem in the country. Um, so I talked about the state politics about virginity. I talked about medicalization of virginity in Turkey, which is a huge problem uh, for me. You know, perhaps the most important aspect of the problem in Turkey. So. Um, other than that, we did interviews together. People approached us and said, can we do interviews? And in, in these interviews, sometimes we were together, sometimes it was only me, but... Um, and I have received emails from readers whom I, I never met, and sometimes they really went through a lot of trouble. They emailed the publisher, the publisher contacted me, I, con I contacted Hannah, and I said, look, there's a reader who is thanking both of us for writing such a great work, and, and, and I made friends with some of those readers. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. <laughs>